This is Yochi Shimazu in Hong Kong, uh, focusing today on the international scandal called Panama Papers. What are the Panama Papers? The global financial scandal, which is now being uh, plastered all over the international media, on newspaper front pages, in, in the evening news, is based on 11 million legal documents which were supposedly hacked from a Panamanian law firm called Mosset and Fonseca. The charges that are being laid by the, a group called the International Consortium of Journalists and the Süddeutschland Daily, a South uh, German newspaper based in Munich, is that top world leaders, including Vladimir Putin and the president of Iceland, leaders in uh, China and India, uh, are being accused of money laundering, bribery, even drug trafficking. Hard to believe. And you know something? It's, a lot of these charges are not believable because the ICIJ admits banking in foreign countries is not illegal in most parts of the world. So they're making these accusations, wild accusations against world leaders based on legal documents that were stolen. And we're going to get into the deeper side of this story. Every one of these parties is deeply connected to the CIA and apparently working on behalf of the U.S. Treasury, the Group of Seven uh, financial group uh, of Europe and the United States and Japan, the largest financial powers and the central bankers, and the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank. Now, first off, let's look into the claim that hackers uh, were able to remove these 11 million files from the computers at Mosek and Fonseca. Legal documents are that thick. They're, they run hundreds of pages, these contracts, uh, especially for international trade, finance, and commerce. So what was a more probable case is that these were actually transferred in a hard disk from the law offices of Mossack and Fonseca, not involuntarily, but given by this company. I say that because Jürgen Mossack, who is the founder of this law firm, is a German national who migrated to Latin America. Let's look into his background a bit. Jürgen Mossack was, during World War II, a member of the SS, the Waffen-SS, which is an elite Nazi German military unit. Mossack was most likely a member of the Galen organization, led by General Reinhard Galen, who was chief of intelligence for the German army under the Nazi government. He mysteriously surfaces after the war in Panama, and you've probably all heard of the Rat Lines, escaped SS officers who made their way to Latin America. He's one of them. They were able to do so because the Galen organization was integrated with the CIA after the war and assisted by the CIA, by Alan Dulles, the first CIA director, and made their way to Latin America. Mossack, Jürgen Mossack resurfaces again during the Bay of Pigs invasion. The Bay of Pigs invasion was organized by the CIA against a new revolutionary government of Fidel Castro. Uh, thousands of right-wing militias from Latin America were involved in this and were flown to Cuba on uh, CIA-provided airplanes and shipped on landing boats provided by the CIA. Jürgen Mosek was part of this operation because m many of that flotilla and those planes came from Latin America. And he is a self-admitted CIA officer. He admits that he worked for the CIA and still works for the CIA. His partner, Ramon Fonseca, was a crony of Manuel Noriega when Noriega was still working for the CIA. He was a Panamanian dictator who was facilitating drug shipments through Panama for the Medellin and Cali cartels, the cocaine cartels. So Fonseca is a dirty lawyer, yes. Now, one thing we've got to remember, the one thing we've got to remember is that who directed the shipments of cocaine from Colombia through Panama into Mexico, across the Gulf of Mexico, into the United States? None other than the CIA. This was exposed by Gary Webb, a reporter with the San Jose Mercury, who uh, uh, wrote the very famous headline, the drugs in the United States, cocaine in the United States, 
came out of the Nicaraguan War, the U.S. military intervention, the secret war against uh, Nicaragua. So here we have a total CIA operation right from the start, these two lawyers completely involved with, these, with the CIA's operations. Now, these very same people are accusing the world leaders, oh, you're a drug trafficker, oh, you're a money launderer. Is this the pot calling the kettle black? Give us a break here. What is really going on? Next on our list, the Süddeutsche Zeitung, the daily uh, of Munich, Germany. That was the first newspaper after the World War II defeat of Nazi Germany to be given a license by the U.S. military occupation. This is a newspaper deeply connected with the U.S. military, the Pentagon, and the CIA. It's basically a propaganda arm of American forces in Germany. Munich is also the headquarters of Radio Free Europe and Radio Liberty, which are the propaganda organs of the CIA. So this is all part of the CIA media operation inside Germany, which is trying to retain control over Germany as it has done throughout the Cold War. Now, next question. What is the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, ICIJ, which published the offshore leaks, the Swiss leaks, and now the Panama Papers? It was part of the Center for Public Integrity created by Charles Lewis. He was a producer for CBS 60 Minutes, very famous one. He was disillusioned by the way the American media sold out to George Bush and uh, wanted to create an alternative news service. Unfortunately, he resigned in 2005, and since then, ICAG has been nothing more than an arm of the U.S. Treasury, which runs its own secret services, uh, and of the CIA, and the British Exchequer, and the G7 group. So it's a very corrupted media organization. Its most famous, probably, report before Panama Papers was the Swiss leaks. And let me talk to you a little bit about the background of how Swiss leaks came about. It was Edward Snowden himself, the famous whistleblower, uh, who left the CIA because of the Swiss leaks. He was assigned in Geneva, Switzerland, by the CIA as their tech communications expert when a CIA team targeted Swiss bankers in Geneva, in the private banking sector, and basically these uh, spies, American spies, would go drinking with Swiss bankers, try to get them drunk, and try to arrange car accidents. So uh, they would be incriminated and where they would be threatening these bankers with a, a, a trial, which means the end of their career, and would we'll offer them. They would come up and offer them and say, look, we can get you out of this court case if you provide us the list of your customers, and which they did, the bankers did. The bankers were very scared. They had families that were very scared of the CIA on top of that. Another uh, source for Swiss leaks was Hervé Falciani. He was a, basically a record uh, keeper at HSBC in Zurich, in Switzerland, and he was kidnapped by Mossad, the Israeli Secret Service, and who, was say, who told them, we are looking for the accounts of businessmen who are financing Hezbollah in Lebanon, okay? He was released uh, through the CIA intervention, and the CIA basically told him, don't fly to France, go to Spain. When he arrived in Madrid, he was arrested and imprisoned. And all of his data was then turned over to the Americans, and this became the source of the so-called Lagarde paper. Christine Lagarde, the head of, now today the head of the IMF, was then the finance minister of France. This is how she got the list of all the clients of private banking. And uh, they were accused of dodge, tax evasion, dodging taxes, of using offshore accounts and so on. And Switzerland banking industry was forced to break its secrecy. Now I personally, as an investigative journalist, invest, investigating other investigative journalists as to their methods, their ethics, and their veracity, I was in New York in March 2014. I repeatedly phoned the ICIJ offices only got their answering services, it took me days, nearly a week, and I only had a week to spend there, to contact the head of ICIJ, Gerard Ryle, who is the president of the group, 
Uh, and I, he said, send me, a, he, he told me, send me an e email message. I said, I will. I said, you, you claim, ICIJ claims that its offshore leaks information came in a hard drive that was mailed to them through the US mail. I said, I'd like to see the envelope that was posted in. I want to see the post date, when it was mailed, where it was mailed from. He said, talk to Marina Guerrero, head of the project. I sent her an email with a long list. I want to see a photocopy of that document, of, the, of, that, uh, of that envelope. I would like to know your understanding of the laws of the majority of countries of the world. It is not illegal to have a bank account in another country. I want to know if your group, you have 70 investigative journalists in your group, they're researching finance, they should know something about international business law and finance, that offshore accounts are not just used by drug lords and money launderers. The vast majority of accounts are used for business dealings, international business dealings, particularly for the commodities market. If, for example, you're a Chinese official or an official from a country with a large population but not a lot, a lot of uh, food growth, you know, desert country, the Middle East, you set up an offshore account because it would take you two weeks to two months to send $50 million to buy wheat on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It would take you a long time in the spot market. You know, there's Rotterdam. Uh, Rotterdam is the center of the spot oil market. You can't place a bid to, uh, wait a minute, give me two weeks to place money. You've got to place that bid in 10 minutes. The only way you can do this is with offshore banking in, in so-called tax havens, which are not necessarily tax havens, but business transaction centers. And uh, so this is a standard business practice. It is not illegal in Hong Kong where many of the Chinese dealings are at. In fact, Hong Kong encourages tax havens. And why? Why is Hong Kong not worried about tax evasion? Because Hong Kong has an income surplus. It has a revenue surplus. The government there makes more money than it spends. In contrast, the United States, Britain, France, there's Japan, are suffering terrible deficits. They can't control their, their government spending. They are mismanaged. So therefore, they're worried. Oh, our citizens might escape to the Caribbean with their money, and uh, we're not going to be able to tax them. They're going to try to squeeze every penny they can out of their citizens, out of residents, and so forth. They're going to try to prosecute foreign officials, foreign businessmen, to try to get fines, get court cases, uh, extradite them to the U.S., uh, get court cases, get fines, so the U.S. and British and French government can make uh, backs in the bad debt, they, you, know, the, you know, the billions and trillions in bad, 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 bad debt that they owe. So basically, offshore leaks, Swiss leaks, Panama Papers is an instrument of the U.S. Treasury, the British Exchequer, and the French Finance Ministry to uh, pay back their debts. And what they're trying to do is squeeze the citizens from countries which don't have debts. It's the poor, powerful countries trying to impose their debt burden upon the weaker, richer countries. Now, ICIJ is a very well-financed organization. They have a huge office right in the heart of Washington, D.C. They have a group of 70 journalists worldwide who are paid quite well uh, for investigative journalists. Most investigative journalists get hardly anything. You know, they do their gum chewing on their own budget. Very tough life. Who are they financed by? Where is the source of money? Well, one, George Soros, head of the quantum hedge fund, Soros Management. These are massive money laundering organizations. They work for the money launderers. Omidyar Foundation. Pierre Omidyar is part of the Shah of Iran's group who came to America. Again, a hedge fund operator. Another, basically hedge funds are money laundering operations. They're completely unregulated. Okay, they will operate all around the world. They're also, one of the financiers of ICIJ is called Sam Zamuri. He's called the Banana Man. He was the businessman who owned United Fruit Company, which called upon the CIA and the Pentagon to overthrow the Arbenz government in Guatemala in 1954. This began the whole CIA cycle of intervention in Central America. So the guy who has destroyed, you know, the, the, did the first blow against 
Central America. Sam Zamuri, the banana man, is financing ICIJ. Isn't this really ironic? Okay, this is the heart of cartel country running ICIJ. So ICIJ is basically an instrument of the U.S. government. It's just out there claiming to be investigative journalists. And as an investigative journalist myself for more than 30 years, I'll tell you one thing and it's a fact. I myself individually have broken more important stories, more critical stories, more decisive stories than their entire group. Three times as many at least. What should we call ICIJ if they're not really investigative journalists? I would call it the International Consortium of Yellow Journalism. Sensationalism, lies, exaggeration, disinformation in service of the big corporations and banks and, and the uh, mismanaged governments of the West. That's what they are. They're a group of yellow journalists. They have no right to have NGO status, and I think we need a further investigation, and that's what I'm doing. I'm an investigative journalist investigating people who pretend to be investigative journalists and claim that title, which they do not deserve. They are insulting our profession, and I tell you, I will defend the integrity of our profession, and I will continue going after them.